Welcome on in, golf fans. It's your boy, G.S. Luke, here with our course breakdown for this week's Mexico Open. Going to break down the Norman course at Vedanta Vallarta and let you know everything you need for your research this week. We'll go through the course, actually take a look at each hole and some of the shots required this week. And then at the end, especially important for DFS and selecting some of those outrights, we're going to go through my key stats for analysis and, of course, my comp courses to give you an idea of the sort of metrics and perhaps events you should be keeping your eye on to try and identify your top plays of the week. So with a ton to get into, let's go ahead and get this thing started off. So it's the second year we're seeing this track. So it's a resort style course over there in Mexico and on the longer end of the spectrum, a par 71 at over 7,400 yards. So off the tee distance, as you would expect, definitely comes into play, but even more so than you'd imagine because this is a Greg Norman design. And if there's anything that he's known for, it is tough off the tee tracks. So whether it's the distance here, again, almost 7,500 yards, and that is, again, for par 71, right? It's not even a par 72 or a par 73 like you see for a few other tournaments here on schedule um it's an absolute beast out there you also have water in play you have water in play i believe on seven tee shots a lot of your approach shots almost every single par three has water in play of some sort i think four of the five par threes have that water in play uh, it's a difficult ball strikers kind of track so I thought, think a lot of people, myself included last year, thought it might play a little bit easier than it did, but the winning score was in the high teens under par. I projected it closer to 23, 24 under par, but a lot of that is due to the length and the ball striking required around here because it's not just off the tee that's difficult. You're also dealing with extremely long approach shots. 44% of your shots are over 200 yards this week, which is you know vastly higher than what you see week to week. And I believe right around 20% of your shots are under 115, uh, yeah, 125 yards uh, was the bucket they were using for that. So um, typically that's closer to 40, 45%. That 40-45% is going to be on the longer end of the spectrum, whether it's the long par threes, the 500-yard par fours, um, or of course those long par fives, which are almost impossible to reach in two. Uh, two of them on the back nine, a little bit more reachable than most, but still requiring a 200-plus yard approach shot. Um, you're going to be tested in all of those key areas. In terms of your scoring average, um, it was 0.68 shots under par last year, uh, which is what you'd expect for a resort-style track. Um, kind of like the Corrales Punta Cana, which is another pass palm track. Uh, the greens, the rough, everything around Vedanta Vallarta is going to be the pass palm grass. Um, Corrales, another longer track, um, plays right around a half a stroke under par. Actually, sometimes even plays over par over there in the Dominican Republic. So. Um, definitely on the easier end of the spectrum, and a lot of that is because of the width of the fairways um, and the size of the greens. The fairways are right around 40 yards wide, 40.4 to be exact, and they're hit at a 62.3% clip, which is about 3.7% lower than your tour average, um, which is mostly due to the distance. You're going to hit driver on almost every single hole. So unlike the RBC Heritage with Harbor Town, unlike some of these shorter tracks that we've seen over the last month, you're going to have to hit driver on almost every single tee shot, um, which is why you see a slightly lower driving accuracy despite having massive targets out there. So you're going to have large targets. If you're an elite driver of the golf ball, you can still hit 10 plus fairways around here, which is going to be extremely beneficial. Um, some of the elite tier driving distance and accuracy players were able to gain prolifically last year. Um, of course, that included your winner, John Rum. And then the greens are right around 7,000 square foot. So just slightly lower green regulation average than your PGA Tour week to week um, at 67.9%. So both of those averages slightly lower than usual. All of that is because of the length, right? 7,000 square foot greens, uh, that's nearly double the size of Harbor Town. It's at least, you know, 1,500, maybe even 2,000 square foot more than your average tour course out there. Uh, so the, you know, lower numbers here are usually just because of the distance. You have to be a bomber to find success here. And if you take a look at the top 10 last year, Almost every single player gained off the tee. In fact, the only player in the top 15 to lose strokes off the tee um, there for the first iteration of this event was Ches Reeby, who um, kind of on brand gained with everything else, including over a stroke per round on approach, about a stroke per round with the putter, um, gained a bunch around the green as well. Again, very much so on brand for Ches Reeby. Everyone else was a huge prolific gainer. That included John Rahm, who gained nearly six strokes off the tee. Brandon Wu gained over four strokes off the tee. Cameron Jan 
champ, champ gained right around six strokes off the tee for the event. Um, and all of those players finished in the top 10. So not a surprise. Addy beast of a golf course, like what you have here at Vedanta Vallarta. Uh, that ended up being the name of the game. All right, and now for a hole-by-hole -hole breakdown. So a few changes on here. First off, the golf course for the PGA Tour is about 300 yards longer. So uh, we'll talk through some of the notable changes in terms of distances, but it's also set up as a par 73 for resort members. It's only going to be a par 71 for the tour players, and it's a weird par 71. At the par 73 setup, there are six par fives. There are still going to be four par fives for this setup. So it's strange there are five par threes, uh, and that's how it adds up to a par 71. So uh, a few changes that we'll have to note on here, but hole number one looks pretty similar under both setups. It's a dog leg from left to right. There's the water to the right to worry about. And uh, one thing to note is that the rough here is pretty much non-existent. It's about an inch long at the very most. Um, past pollen grass can be a little bit sticky, especially in the morning. So um, if you're going to miss fairways, it's better to do so in the afternoon than the morning hours. Uh, but it's not going to pose these players too much trouble. That's why the driving accuracy percentage actually slightly lower than your tour average uh, despite having some of these large landing areas so the bailouts to the left you'll see plenty of players do that um, just don't miss the water off the tee don't mess with it with your approach shot um, depending on your tee shot whether you get it in the short stuff also depending on pin location this could be a go zone for a birdie particularly with like a front left pin location um, or it could just be get it on the surface and two putt for something like a back right Hole 2 is 445. This is also a very similar setup for what they have in the PGA Tour. Um, so holes 1 and 2 could be a wedge into the green, which of course um, could be a birdie birdie start depending on how precise you are. Um, but just to give you guys an idea of the around the green test here, a lot of your bunkers are in the fairway. You can see there's actually over 100 bunkers on property. Um, not all of them are even present on the overhead views here. Um, the views are a little bit older than the renovation that was done on property. Uh, but a lot of greenside bunkers were added so if you're in one of those I mean, it's a straightforward shot there's not really a lot of hollows on these greens that you can hide pins um that's something that you'll notice they're very circular they're maybe more like an oval in terms of their shape and uh, you can't really hide a pin location is i guess what i'm hinting at there so whether you're in a greenside bunker whether you're on this past palm fairway um, that lines every single green uh, you're going to have a, a straightforward around the green shot so it's not really something i'm looking at that much this week because uh they're, they're all really straightforward shots right there's not going to be a huge test around the green hole three is 436 par four dog leg from right to left um, you can see the difficulty off the tee right you know the angles created it makes this relatively narrow right it's not like you're playing this straight down the shoot over here right we're teeing off from the left side um, over this bunker even uh, so you can go through end up in one of these pot bunkers a lot of players are going to end up in the rough through the fairway over here um, and then have a wedge in so off the tee it can create some issues but if you drive the ball well you're going to find success um, hole four is a par four for the pga tour so this won't be a par five players are going to be a little bit more aggressive off the tee right try and push it down a little bit further and leave themselves about 190 maybe 200 yards into the green so uh, this is a hole where the bombers are going to be able to take you know advantage whereas some of the shorter players on tour are just going to be hoping to make a par here um, and this is where you start to see the distance advantage hole five long par three 206 yards um, the water is in play because of the sloping here it's like a volcano style surface so everything slopes down into the water you'll see players that overshoot the green end up in the water over or if you hit a snap hook of course um, the water to the left can come and play hole six 613 this is a par five it is the singular par five on the front nine and it is on the longer end i mean the longer players like rom cameron champ um, were able to reach this in two last year um, but if you're not an elite tier bomber you're probably not thinking about it unless it plays downwind um, significantly one of the four days Hole seven is three three at eleven. It actually plays slightly longer. So um, there's a tee box they added that makes this closer to like three twenty, three thirty for a, for at least a few of the pin locations. Um, so it can be drivable, but again, only if it's downwind and for some of the longer players on tour. Hole eight is four ninety six. A tough par four dog leg from left to right. Um, you can see how visually intimidating this is, right? Let's go to the previous shot just so I can show you. 
it's angled. It looks a lot narrower than it is because of the angle that you're coming in at. And if you miss left, you're going to leave yourself like 250 yards in. So a lot of players are going to, you know, favor the right side. And of course, there's water there. So it's it's visually intimidating and on the longer end of the spectrum as well. Hole nine is a par three. It's actually one of the shorter par threes on the course. One of the shorter approach shots that you're going to have um, has water in play, green side bunkers. And uh, just like the other par three, it's a volcano kind of style where everything slopes down to the hazard. So if you miss over the green, you're likely going to hit a down slope and end up pretty close down to the hazard line. Hole 10 is, I would say, a really difficult start because it doesn't play 387. They use the tee box that is the whole way back here. And you can actually see it on the over overhead look. And I'm assuming that they've had tournaments here for quite some time, even before the renovation. And uh, it does truly play close to 600 yards. Um, I think a lot of times they may have an intermediate box. I think it, it plays closer to 500 for most tournaments. Let's see. Did I set this up right? Oh, I think I was clicking the wrong one. Set T position. That's what we want to do. All right, so that's 400 yards. If I move the tee back here, is that the 500 yard? Yeah, it is. So they, this is the tee box that they'll be using. Um, incredibly difficult tee shot. You saw a few players last year, especially early in the morning, not even reach the fairway. And yes, the fairway starts right up here where the overhead view starts there. Um, a few players yeeted it into the water to the right because they tried to give it a little bit extra to get to the short stuff. And then to the left, um, they've taken a lot of these trees out. It's not nearly as dense now as what it you know was when the overhead view was taken here, um, but it's sloped and there's a bunch of rocks over there. So uh, good luck. This is, a, in my opinion, if you're starting at hole number 10, you're probably starting on the most difficult hole in the golf course. Hole 11, water and play, par 3. Um, slightly longer than the last par 3, but still a long iron test, um, particularly when exposed to the wind. Hole 12 is a par 5. It is 620 yards. Um, this one is reachable in two by the longer players. You have to be really aggressive down the right to have a chance. Um, so let's say you're one of the longer players. You get it out there like 320. Um, this tree does obscure your view, but if you can hit a fade around it, if you can draw it around the right side of it, um, you can reach the green because let's see, what is the direct line? Just 285, which again, for the longer players on tour is doable. Hole 13, 171, shorter par 3. This is the only par 3 without water in play. Hole 14 is a par 5. It is 577. Um, this is reachable in 2 for almost everyone in the field. So it is one of the two par 5s uh, that you don't have to be a bomber to reach. Hole 15, 462. Um, you do have water in the left side, but there's such a bailout to the right that no one's going to mess with it. If you, if you hit it in the water over here, you're an absolute jabroni. So you'll see a lot of guys just aim right, try and hit the straight ball. If they hook it, they're in the fairway. If they fade it, um, they're probably okay over here near the cart path. Um, and you can leave yourself a mid iron. So it's actually one of the easier, more gettable holes on property. Hole 16, this is not a par 5. I believe this is a par four converted. Actually plays a little bit shorter. Um, yeah, because I know hole number 18 is a finishing par five. Hole 17 is 225. This is a really difficult par three. The water certainly comes into play for any miss hit. Um, you miss to the right. You're left with difficult uh, around the green shot. It's a, it's a beast, right? And then you finish with a par five. So hole 16, yeah, that's the converted par four because hole 18 plays as a par five. Um, it's on the shorter end. It's the most reachable of the par five. So it's the other reachable par five for pretty much everybody. And uh, you will see a few equals here to finish your round. So you have some difficult body blows, right? Those long approaches. And then you have a few easy par fives that one potentially drivable par four uh, to mix in a few birdie looks as well. Now that we've seen the golf course, let's go through some of my key metrics for the week that I'm using to identify my top plays. And at number one, we've got shots gained off the tee. And I was tempted to just make it driving distance. But with some of the water in play, the added boost that you get for hitting the short stuff here, I think that having that elite tier distance and accuracy is going to be a huge X factor for a lot of the field. So for me, I'm looking for that elite, elite combo. I mean, if you look at the top five, it was some of the longer, more accurate players on the PGA Tour. So I know it's only a one year sample size, but not only does it check the stat perspective, look at any sort of correlation model. If you look at the ones on Data Golf, uh, they're loving driving distance this week. Uh, if you just take it from the logic perspective, it makes a lot of sense too, right? It's a 7,500 yard par 71. The par fives are there's still four of them out there. You're going to have a ton of long iron shots. Um, so yeah, 
shots gained off the tee, whether it's distance or it's accuracy, um, is something that I'm weighing quite heavily this week. And at number two, we've got shots gained approach. The one thing to note here, you know, approach play is always going to be important, but I'm especially looking at those long iron ranges, the 175 to 200, the 200 to 225, 225 to 250, you name it, right? The 250 plus yard range are all going to be a lot more important this week than they are for most weeks on tour. And that 50 to 125, that 125 to 150 is going to be essentially non-existent. There's only really, really going to be maybe one, two of those shots the entire around and it's going to be when you're out of position on a par five so if you're looking to try and model this course it is all about that distance all about the off the tee play and then uh, taking advantage with those long irons at number three we've got par five scoring so this one's a little bit different i was tempted to include shots gained putting here in the top three but we've got past palm greens and it's we don't have much data right we have a few sporadic events that use this past palm surface um so not nearly the sample size i'd love to go with so par five scoring slightly edges it out and with the four par fives if you look at the guys that finished in the top five top ten last year they absolutely destroyed them whether it was making birdies on them adding in the occasional eagle there in hole 18 that you saw from time to time um, that's how you really separated yourself from the rest of the field so i'm trying to take a look at players that are able to take advantage of that that have the distance a lot of those players are also players that take advantage of the par fives um, if you're going to look at punting numbers Past Palm Greens are, you know, is important. It's something that you should look at, but do realize that it's a small sample size. So if somebody is outrageously good on past Palm, just keep in mind that, you know, maybe they only played one or two events. If they're outrageously bad on the surface, right? Maybe don't condemn them because they only have a one or two event sample size. But if you're somebody like Tony Finau that on past Palm has won, he has a bunch of top five finishes then maybe that's something that you consider as a positive for a player. So for me, those are the sort of key metrics I'm looking at. Um, in addition to birdie or better percentage, opportunities gained, which are always extremely important when looking at fantasy scoring stuff um, to try and identify those top plays of the week. And now for a few comp courses. At number one, we've got the retired PGA Tour course. El Chameleon Golf Club, the home of the old Mayakoba Classic, was the Worldwide Technologies Open at Mayakoba in the last few years. Uh, kind of happy that we don't have to say that name anymore. That just long rambling name right there. But yeah, El Chameleon, another off the tee test. It's a little way shorter than what you're going to have this week, but still you had to be extremely accurate and long there to set up a lot of those wedges into greens. And then it was all about the putting on past Palm. So it's not a perfect comp, especially because it is so much shorter than what you're going to have this week. But similar from the agronomy perspective, similar part of the world, of course, another Mexico course, the same area. And from the off the tee angles perspective, um, another Greg Norman, design that is meant to intimidate you so i think there's a lot of similar looks although it is a little bit shorter next up we've got corrales golf club which is the home of the dominican republic event that i you know mentioned a little bit earlier uh, another really long course so off the tee it checks the distance perspective uh, maybe not as visually intimidating it's a little bit more wide open there aren't as many hazards the ocean comes to play on like three holes around that golf course um, so you know every one of these courses is going to have their flaws i think it's just a little bit easier off the tee but from the ball striking perspective, from the irons perspective, we are looking for long iron players around that track. Um, so I think there's a lot of crossovers, including the past Palm greens that are once again a part of the picture. And at number three, they've got a past Palm golf course that I think a lot of people forgot about. That is Kiaba Island, the ocean course, which was the home of the 2021 PGA Championship. So not everyone in the field has experience, but more what I want to look at are who finished in the top five to top 10 at that golf course, because that is a Pete Dye design, which is not a Greg Norman design, but another architect that loves to have visually intimidating golf courses whether it's from the you know distance perspective which Kiowa Island is nearly 7,900 yards um, which by the way longest course they've ever played on the PGA Tour um, at least for a major championship golf and then this week right I know it's not nearly as long but it still brings that same sort of test if you look at the top five top ten at Kiowa tons of bombers out there so just once again the kinds of players that had success at Kiowa are the kind of guys 
guys you want to kind of consider because there's not a ton of guys that have that crossover experience that are even in the field this week. Um, the top two, El Camilleon, you have a few guys that have played there over the last few years. Uh, then Corrales, a ton of guys have experience there um, because it's a similar strength of field um, at a similar kind of golf course. So I think Corrales is where you're going to find a lot of your data. You'll find a few people that played at El Camilleon this year. Um, Kiba Island, more for just from the, the stat profile perspective. Alrighty, guys, that is all I've got for the course breakdown. Looking forward to this week. I know it's not the strongest field, but we have Shot Tracker. It's your back to your regular old PGA DFS. So, going to be a few more eyes on content this week. Hopefully, a little bit more participation in contests. Hopefully, for Showdown, we can get better contest selection because of that. Um, the team concept doesn't really keep me that much engaged. I won a bunch of money last week when it came to PGA DFS. Um, on the prop side, profited every single slate, whether it's for PGA or for Live. So it was a good one in terms of ROI, just not the most engaging, fun to watch event. So I'm glad to be back to having a cut, being back at a regular old PGA Tour stroke play event. But like I said, appreciate you guys. Thank you for all the support here on the channel. Smash that like button before hopping on out of here. Go ahead, comment down below what you think the winning score is going to be. Last year, it was in the high teens under par. I'm going to take 18 under par. Similar kind of range right around last year's winning score. But go ahead, let me know your thoughts down below. A lot of it could come down to weather, right? It is a course relatively close to the coast. So could get a few winds that kick things up. Uh, but would love to hear your thoughts early on in the week. Until next time, best of luck with those outright bets, any plays that you're going with this week. Only outright so far, Tony Finau. I think he's going to have a lot of success, uh, but you'll hear about him a whole lot from me this week and why I like good old Tony the Tiger. But go about, go ahead, go. perhaps let me know who you think is going to win this event as well. Like I said, best of luck. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of the content to come, and I'll catch you guys for the Core Plays video. Mm -hmm.